Andrew Hill. Um, I am the clinical lead for stroke services at St Helens and Knowsley. Um, over about the last nine months or so, I've been working with the Stroke Sentinel National Audit Project, uh, which was originally based at the Royal College of Physicians in London and has recently moved to King's College, London. Um, really working on a redesign of our tool set. Um, and I was sort of challenged by Emma, who's fortunate, uh, formerly of the same programme, to sort of describe what sort of our objectives are and whether there are sort of learning points that we can bring across to other projects. Um, so really, uh, if we're going to start off with some of the basics, which is why you might actually want to use R at all and how we might want to use it. And then we can move on to the, some of the slightly more complicated things about sustainable workflows and developing tools that can be reused. Um, and what sort of position that puts us into. Um, so, first of all, obviously it's a good challenge to test the age of your audience, because I do realise that some people will have no idea who that is anymore. <laughs> um, you know. um, so, I started um, in a different century, uh, possibly, um, where that was the first encounter you get to data analysis. Um, fortunately, We've gone beyond that a little bit more now. Um, so most of us, our first encounter with data, uh, data analysis is from Excel. You know, that's, that's usually where you end up starting to do something with Excel. And then you sort of realize that you, know, you can do more things elsewhere. Interestingly, some people take that to extremes. So this guy um, makes these amazing photo and pictures entirely in Excel. He's mad. Right, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, um, but it's proof that you can do anything in Excel if you try hard enough. Um, and that website just has some of the most amazing pictures ever. But you've got to think he's bonkers. Uh, but the question he says is, is that you know, um, it's easier than using some of the more complicated tools, and I don't need to learn so much about it. Fair enough. Just because you can, though, doesn't mean you should. Um, which I think is, is a sort of really important message. And so I think most of us that have spent any time trying to analyse data in Excel for any period of time sort of go, well, I'll make this really complicated worksheet that's got these sort of 3,000 formulae in it. Uh, and then I've realised that I've got other users involved. So I'll protect these cells and I'll hide these rows and these columns and I'll add this data validation in it. And then I can't really get the output the way I want it, so I'll write this bit of VBA code and these macros, and I'll sort of hide that in there as well. And before you know it, you have this ridiculously difficult to, to maintain, extremely complicated um, bit of code that basically your user is messing with the actual workflow at the same time as they're entering the data. It breaks horrendously easy. And as a result, you've got really bad workflow and really poor reusability. I'm hoping that that is a message that most of us in this room get, otherwise we probably wouldn't be here and we'd probably be working on something else. Um, so the question is, is, when we appreciate that, what does good like, look like? So good, really, when we're looking at these sorts of projects, is we've got something that's highly reproducible, highly scalable, doesn't matter whether we're measuring 100 things, 1,000 things, 10,000 things. Um, and highly reusable, so we can develop stuff in one project and we can redeploy it to another project. Our goal is really to be the designer of the tools and not necessarily the one producing the end results, which I think is something that quite often we tend to like to give people the answers, but it's actually more useful to give them the tool to get the answers themselves. Um, and we also want high flexibility of the output according to the task in hand. So in some situations, you just want a quick runoff of some data that you can just answer a single one-off question. As a clinician, most of the time, when I've discovered an interesting question and someone's given me an answer, I tend to then go and ask another awkward question, which is related to the first question but slightly more complicated. And that tends to be why you want to be able to dig straight back into it. So very rarely do we actually have truly disposable analysis that we do. You generally want to make sure that you can get these results out according to the task. So ultimately, you do need to send out stuff in office formats, not uncommonly, because someone else will want to mess with it in Excel, even if you don't. Um, you generally want reports that are in a read-only format, so PDF is great for that. You want to be able to modify your queries based on your original query without messing up too much your original work. Um, 
And that also brings us on to real-time dashboards. And I'm well aware we've got uh, an excellent talk this afternoon on shiny dashboarding and things that things you can do in, uh, in R. We also need to be really wary about information governance. And, and we are ultimately dealing with an increasing number of records. So when we talk about the SNAP data set, so we have a national audit data set of every patient who's had a stroke since 2013 in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, which is 250,000 patients and counting at the moment. And that has got individual patient record level data. So any analysis that you do that ends up with patient record level data, you've got to be careful because there's a quarter of a million of them floating around. And it's very easy to leave a trail effectively of, patient, of identifiable data if you're not careful. The good news is that R sort of allows us to tackle many of those problems. And, I, and I'll sort of go through some of the ways in which I've tackled that when I've been looking at SNAP um, over the next few minutes, really. So, as I say, SNAP is a huge data set. It's a very complicated data set. We're HQIP commissioned. And what we do is a continuous high-quality national audit of stroke care of every patient in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland since 2013. Um, there are over 300 data, data fields per patient record, and each time a patient has a stroke, they get a new record. Um, and we measure their care from arrival to the admitting stroke unit right up to discharge at six months. There are over 200 contributing teams, and that gives you a shed load of stakeholders, everything from individuals such as me as a clinical lead who wants to understand the operational performance of my team and what I can do better, I've got senior members within the team that want to undertake quality improvement work and want to feed off that data. We have um, executive boards within trusts. We've got executive boards at CCG level. We report nationally to NHS England. Um, we are a major data source for large-scale stroke research. And all these different stakeholders have got completely different needs out of this data. We also are accessible to the public, so the, um, the website for SNAP is www.strokeaudits.org, most of which is still running off the old um, data tool set at the moment, uh, which is mostly starter based, but you'll get the general gist of what we're trying to achieve with all of that. Um, and so we have to be able to produce these reports in a way that the public can understand, including patients who have aphasia, so severe communication difficulties due to their stroke or visual problems, so that means Flexible, data, flexible output formats are really key to all of this. Um, so, as I say, we're in the process, really, of redeveloping these tools. And it's been going on uh, over around a six to nine month period. I really only spend um, approximately half to one day a week on this. So this has been an ongoing project over a, a longish period of time, but low intensity because I have to treat the occasional patient as well. Otherwise, my bosses don't get happy. Um, so at the moment, Audit data is collected on a web tool. It's stored on an SQL server. We take snapshots of data on the lock dates um, for analysis, and it's exported as a CSV file. Uh, at the moment, the analysis scripts were in starter to produce the tables of data, and then we went from starter to office to make the, to make the document formats with some VBA scripts to then tidy them all up. Where we've got is to redesign the tool chain for maintainability, of which R has been uh, an excellent tool for working through that. Um, there are a lot of manual steps in the original process of which we've been trying to eliminate those so that the, auto the process is fully automated where possible. In other words, we can actually sit the R scripts with the SQL server and run the whole thing in the background without having to actually have as much manual intervention from analysts. Um, we want the ability to identify outliers at national level. At the moment, there was a lot of manual trawl to try and identify when a team was not doing quite what we expected them to do and trying to tease out the differences there. Obviously, we've mentioned the use of CSV files. This is not the way you really want to handle patient identifiable data. So ideally, you want to remove that and not deal with patient level data at all. Ideally, your analyst should only have access to aggregated and anonymized data. So that's quite a big step. Um, one of the goals we've got is towards real-time dashboarding. Um, and we've got nice demos so far of a, of a shiny dashboard that's working. The challenge with this many measures is that there's no such thing as a small one. Um, so, um, so we've been building that up progressively. Um, we have over 2,000 different individual measures we, we report. We've got about 40 key indicators that people generally see in the public. 
Um, and stroke care changes remarkably quickly, so we have, to we have the need to change the data set, add or remove components really quickly. And that's leading us on to the bigger goals of basically removing the whole idea of manual entry and then go, right, we've got electronic records, we have the HL7 file format, why don't we pull the data from the electronic record, bring it into the audit? So, with those goals in mind, you can see a re-architecting of the tools gets quite challenging. Where do you start? Well, the first thing is, source control is something that I think, um, as unless you come from a computer science background, source control is often seen as a sort of bit of a computer science thing. I think it's really critical in these sorts of projects. Um, personally, ourselves and the team have been using GitHub. Um, we ha are going to be open sourcing the code. We haven't at the stage in the development stage, um, and that's just because of the, the amount of um, hoops to be jumped through and to make absolutely sure that we can't analyse patient level data. So um, at the moment we have a private repository, but it will be going public at, um, a, at a point in the future when we can. Um, obviously GitHub is not the only option. There are other um, open options out there. Um, and I think the use of source control is really important, firstly in being able to track the changes that you've made to your project and, and to uh, retrieve those changes, but also in terms of collaboration. You know, One of the goals from this is to allow increased collaboration between teams. Source control is really the way to get us to that position. Um, so anyone who's not looked at using things like Git before, definitely have a look at that as a, a, as a learning objective really from this. Um, I think the next thing starts to get interesting, which is if you move away from that Excel mindset, um, there's a tendency to write script-based analysis. And in actual fact, there's a slightly nicer way of doing that in R, which is to actually write package-based analysis. So rather than writing a clear script that starts at A and ends at the end of your script, um, it's actually relatively easy to write new packages in R. So right from the outset, what we've actually done is written all the tools for Snap as packages. The benefit of that is, of course, you can distribute packages to your colleagues very easily. So you can distribute the code really quickly in pre-designed format. They can just download it from GitHub and install. Um, you can deploy different versions as needed. Um, so it, it's quite a nice way of doing it. Um, Jenny Bryan is an excellent speaker when it comes to all matters of R, and if you look her up on YouTube, there are some brilliant talks out there. Um, I did really like the, if you set a work directory that only you've got, I will come in your office and set the computer <laughs> on fire, um, because you've definitely seen that far too often in places. Um, but, but yeah, there's, an, um, there's some very interesting talks around that topic, which are well worth looking up. Um, but no, I really recommend having a little look at... Um, you know, how to write a package, it probably takes me about an hour of additional learning to work out how to do that, and now all my code goes into packages. Instead of writing analysis, I write a function. The parameters, you know, if I need a path name, then the parameter is a fun uh, the function is a parameter um, in that function uh, to pass the path, and your outputs are then defined. Um, it makes it much cleaner. Um, obviously, again, one of the other discussions we've had is about collaboration, and if you're starting to write in that package way, then start to break off stuff that's common and generic. And if you think it's of use to other people, publish it. Stick it out in open source. Allow others to use it. Um, CRAN is a really good way of uploading um, <coughs> common code. Uh, once you've got into the hang of writing a package, it's dead easy to put a, package, uh, a function into a package, put some documentation with it, stick it out there. Um, so in the process of developing Snap stuff, I probably put about 50 different commits into other projects just from little things that I've picked up along the way that I thought would be helpful to other people, um, which has been useful. Um, and then that way everyone gets an improved version of the same code and everyone has less time, you know, it takes a lot less maintenance. Um, the topic of the talk was the art of the possible. So one possibility we've got, we know that there's a challenge with maintaining code and we know the NHS is sometimes a little bit wary and a bit precious about distributing its code openly. One option for us to consider is, of course, whether we actually put something hosted on N3 and actually have code within the NHS that is, that is usable within all NHS organisations. So it's not quite in the open source realm, but is within the NHS realm. And I think if we're dealing with how we access patient records or we have common things that people aren't keen to necessarily put straight out into the open, that might be a useful halfway measure. 
Um, so how did I tackle this in Snap? So in our Snap code at the moment, I actually have four packages. Um, one is the interface code, which deals with bringing the data in. One is the data wrangling engine, which I've referred to as Snap Stats, which is a big package for basically handling what we call cohorts, so working out who we're analyzing the data upon, um, which in Snap does get a bit complicated because you transfer between many different hospitals. Um, and basically, we produce output data through Snap Stats. We have all our common charting functions sat in a Snap Charts package. And then we've got our reports package. So there's a very clear divide between interchange, analysis, charting, reporting into four groups. Why did we do that? Well, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so why did we do that? Well, the reason I did that was primarily that, if I move back on the slides, was, was primarily that if I want to then get rid of CSV files and I want to change directly to entering data from a database, all I do is I chop that package out and I stick a new package into there um, and we can then rapidly interchange it. It's very clear delineation. I'm not sharing variables. I'm not sharing information between the packages. The packages don't, don't need to know about each other. Um, likewise, the Snap Stats engine tends to be rapidly updated because you've got lots of different audit measures. So again, you can shove replacements of the stats package in there. Um, the charting functions, the reason that the charting functions are separate is that if you want to develop a real-time dashboard, you probably want to share the charts. And so the idea with the charting functions is that a dashboard and a report can share common charting functions and common analysis. And then finally in reports, so um, one of the useful things for our studio users is there is a 1.2 preview out which actually supports PowerPoint export um, and our markdown. So if anyone hasn't pick that up, it's well worth a little play with. Um, but we can do our PowerPoint exports from there, we can do stuff from Excel, we can do stuff from PDFs or from our report package. Right, sorry, I shall uh, wrap up. Um, one of the things we've covered earlier was about um, chain, ensuring when you're doing your analysis that you break up anything that's using row-based operations, so patient level data, and your aggregation operations. And so within the package, it's there's a very clear delineation between anything that might be dealing with row-based stuff versus aggregated stuff, and that, again, allows us to ideally move away from having patient-based data um, anywhere um, sort of near our aggregated stuff. Um, and then I think we've covered most of that already. Um, as we said, ideally, you want to avoid um, exposing uh, your patient-level data to... Uh, to anyone that doesn't absolutely need individual level data. Um, so real-time dashboards, as we've said, um, there'll be a talk on that a bit later on uh, this afternoon. Um, one of the things I did pick up along the way is that there is a very nice set of packages, uh, sorry, a very nice um, build called our Shiny Electron, um, and there's a GitHub link for that just there. What our Shiny Electron does is it packages up a Shiny server with Electron, which is a way of basically running a web browser all in a single app. So what that allows you to do is to produce an executable, so an, a, 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 an app that is runnable on a PC or Mac, um, that contains your R Shiny dashboard, your analysis, your copy of R, and all your packages all in the one package, which means that you don't have to have special IT permissions to install R, you don't need IT permissions to install your, uh, your packages. So if you're testing um, some uh, dashboard with just single users, that's a really great way of prototyping something, chucking it out there, getting feedback on it, and then if you think it's going to be formalized, then you set up a shiny server and do all the stuff with IT. Um, so final thing, so other resources. Um, our Studio users probably know this already, but there's loads of useful webinars and conference talks on the R Studio website. Whether you use R Studio or not, they're very valuable. Um, there's a very nice YouTube channel from the R Consortium, if anyone hasn't seen those already. So just search R Consortium on YouTube. I've discussed Jenny Bryan's talks before. I think some of her stuff on code structure and approaching R code is really useful. Um, and then, yeah, we've discussed Twitter. Um, R Stats, the, the Twitter hashtag, and Data at Me is a very good resource in terms of huge amounts of links of things other people have done. And that's it. <laughs>